Louisa May Alcott's War, a drama in two acts by Lavinia Roberts. Characters, Concord folks. Abigail May Alcott, early 20s, female presenting, goes by May, an artist. Julian Hawthorne, late teens, male presenting. Nathaniel Hawthorne's son, introverted, kind, intense. Tall with dark wavy hair, elegantly attired, yet charmingly rumpled. Louisa May Alcott, late 20s, middle sister, witty, precocious, vivacious, a force to be reckoned with, a writer. Anna Alcott Pratt, late 20s, oldest sister, warm, amiable, a talented actress. Hurley Burley House Staff, Dr. John Winslow, early 20s, or as Louisa puts it, exceedingly young, male presenting, avid reader and fan of Browning, Amiably amusing, plain, odd, has a crush on Louisa. Louisa calls him Dr. John. Lizzie Thurber, mid 30s, nurse, a bit of a gossip. Julia Kendall, early 30s, nurse, gentle yet strong, amiable, pint sized and the most faithful of workers, too much for her own good. Soldiers, Robert Bain, late teens, first sergeant, Scottish American. Johann Sur, early 20s, handsome, plain speech and unpolished manner, stubborn, from Pennsylvania, terminably, wound, terminally wounded, eldest son of a German Catholic immigrant. Pauline's passions, Gilbert, late 20s, a charming rake. Pauline, late 20s, pretty and petulant. Manuel, early 20s, naive, young, handsome, devoted to Pauline. Time. December 1862, the American Civil War is underway since April 12th, 1861. The play ends in the early spring of 1863. Uh, synopsis, December 1862, the American Civil War has begun. Louisa May Alcott has experienced some success writing sexy thrillers under pseudonyms, but longs for life experience to fuel her writing. The young abolitionist enlists and is called to duty as a nurse in Union Hotel Hospital in Washington, D.C. Leaving her beloved sisters behind, Alcott faces dire conditions and male colleagues who don't feel women have any place at the hospital. Yet she employs strength, compassion, warmth, and wit to tend to the injured and dying Union soldiers, despite the horrific working conditions. The nurses are even able to provide the wounded men with Christmas festivities. Yet, when Louisa contracts typhoid, the battle for her life begins. Louisa May Alcott's War is a story of love and loss, and how one of America's most beloved writers is forever changed by her experience as a nurse during the Civil War. Act 1, Scene 1. Setting, interior, the Alcott's Parlor, Orchard House, Concord, Massachusetts, December 1st, 1862. At rise, May Alcott is seated drawing in her sketchbook. May? Julian! Good afternoon, May. Really, Julian. At least you didn't wait at the door to be let in like some kind of guest. But uh, I am. A Hawthorne not as much welcome in the Alcott house as an Alcott. Blasphemy of the highest order. You've made angels weep in heaven for such a lie. I should never wish to cause you or any of the Alcott's offense, May. I appreciate that. Besides, offending me is Lou's area of expertise, isn't it? She wouldn't like you intruding on her favorite sport. Do sit down. The city is remarkably well behaved. Oh, let me clear some space for you. Lou does tend to leave a trail of books about her wherever, wherever she goes. May gets up from her drawing to move various books and pillows from the city. Please don't trouble yourself. I hope I'm not intruding on your drawing. You wouldn't be today's first intrusion. What with our special guest? May motions to the sofa. Julia sit, sits down. Guest? I'm sure you'll adore them as much as I do. Adore? Cousin, dearest. I would be delighted to meet her. Him. Him? A uh, him. Cousin! Now, Julian, you mustn't trouble yourself about your country manners or humble dress. 
although my dear cousin is regularly presented at court and recently inherited a vast fortune, he will not be prejudiced against you for being poorly attired and without lo noble lineage. Your apt descriptions of my appearance and pedigree certainly spared my feelings, May. Louisa enters, dressed as a wealthy English aristocrat. She flamboyantly removes her hat and bows in a courtly manner. My dearest, most doteworthy of cousins, Abigail, the delight of my eyes, the beat of my heart, the sun around which my world revolves. Louisa gets to her knee and kisses May's hand dramatically. What does your heart desire, my dearest dove? Only that you are recovering well from your transatlantic voyage. No ocean is too great when you, my light, my beacon, my true north are on the other side. Transatlantic voyage? Julian, my cousin has come from England expressly to visit us. To visit you, my dear? And who is this, the footman? Perhaps you might be so good as to shine my boots. If I can see my reflection on them, I will give you a shiny shilling. There's a good chap. Louisa puts her boot on Julian's lap. Cousin, dearest, this isn't a footman. Not a footman, you say? Ah, yes, now I see. He's too unfashionable for a footman. The stable boy, perhaps, a chimney sweep? This is my much beloved family friend, Julian Hawthorne. Julian stands disgruntled. Who? Julian Hawthorne. He's the son of Nathaniel Hawthorne, the writer of The Scarlet Letter. But I thought you said he was handsome and charming. The very definition of gentility and wit, not a dullard. I, I didn't say all that, surely. You did. She did. She did. I didn't. You did. Any friend of the Alcott's is a friend of mine. Lisa circles him menacingly. Your name? Oh, why, it's Sir... Sir, um... I... You may call me Sir, and if we make better acquaintance, then perhaps I shall give you the honor of calling me by my name, boy. Are you visiting long, sir? As long as this goddess, Aphrodite incarnate, will allow me to bathe in her gloriousness. Louisa gets on one knee and dramatically takes May's hand again. Excuse me, I don't wish to trespass on your time any longer. I can see you're already engaged. Not yet. Give me a day or two. May, give my love to your mother. And Lou. Julian turns to leave. How dare you, boy, turn your back to me in such an egregious manner. Don't you know who I am? No, I don't. You didn't tell me. Sir, something or other. Insolence. I will not stand for such rudeness from an uncouth Yankee. I throw down my gauntlet. Lisa throws down a glove. I demand satisfaction. A duel. No, I challenge you to a race. A race? Louisa? Louisa removes her mustache and other elements of her disguise. Thank you, thank you, Encore, anyone. <laughs> Bravo, your strongest performance yet. Better than my dashing Spaniard. May I have this dance, senorita? Oh, but of course. The two sisters dance around the parlor. Their dance ends in a burst of giggles. Would you care to cut in, senor? The senorita has the feet of an angel. <laughs> Scowling doesn't suit you. It's a real waste of those dimples. I won't stand for waste of dimples, and neither will May. Sir, I should have known at the sir. You should have known when May paid him any mind, when all of us know she adores only you and no one else. That's not true, Lou. You'll forgive us, won't you? Christmas is around the corner, after all. Goodwill, peace on earth, and all the rest. Please, Julian, you wouldn't deprive us of a little amusement. I would prefer if your amusement was not at my expense. But, as always, I cannot deny any pleasure to you, May. To any of the Alcott sisters. Wonderful, you're my favorite gent, besides myself, of course. When I have the mind to be one. I didn't come here expressly to be a pawn in one of your games, Lou. Mother sent me to invite all of you to Christmas tea at Wayside. A formal invitation does ruin the impact of my planned surprise visit. Must you even bother asking? We heartily accept. Shouldn't you ask your mother? Why? 
You are more essential to a sweet Christmas than any baked apples, as far as Marmy is concerned. Uh, your father, then? He's getting ready for one of his conversations. His head is only full of educational reform and wanting to hear the sound of his own voice pontificating in nearly empty auditoriums. He's a little space for Christmas celebrations, where and with whom. I hardly feel like celebrating Christmas. What with the Union's defeat at Bull Run? Not sure why it was necessary to fight a battle there again after we had a ter terrible defeat there already. What of our win at NTM? At what cost? Over 20,000 dead. In a single day, I would hardly call that a victory. I don't quite understand what we are fighting for. Ending slavery, preserving the Union, isn't it as obvious as the nose on your face? Slavery is evil, yes, but this war is a different kind of evil. Nonviolent and peace-loving, just like your father. An evil as insidious as slavery must be ended, Julian, by any means necessary. An avid abolitionist. You certainly sound like your father. Lou only ever sounds like herself, Julian, and I, for one, shouldn't wish it otherwise. Nor I. Although, sometimes, Louisa, I wish you had something else to keep that keen mind engaged other than bother other than tormenting me. Be careful what you wish for. It might be called to duty any day now. Louisa, you know you aren't allowed to enlist. Fair loss. Remember how I nursed Marmy to health last winter? Well... They're looking for nurses, and I enlisted. A nurse? I believe nurses are supposed to help others and not merely cause mischief, Lou. I'm quite capable of tending to the sick and injured and abstaining from mischief, Julian. Besides, I've certainly done enough mischief on you this afternoon to keep me satisfied for a while. There was never a moment when our dear sister Beth was unwashed or the temperature in her room was not to her liking, or her brow was without a cool cloth when Louisa was her nurse. I'm certain you will be the best at whatever endeavor you put your mind to, Miss Alcott. Certainly. And now, I have decided to challenge you to a race, Mr. Hawthorne, where I shall prove exactly that point. I heartily accept. Julian and Louisa race out of the parlor. Must you two always run everywhere? Julian! Lou! May exits after them. End of scene. Act one, scene two. Anna Alcott Pratt's study and the woods near Walden Pond, Concord, Massachusetts, December 11th, 1862. At rise, Anna enters. She is six months pregnant and looking over a letter to Louisa she has just written. My dearest sister, my wild and wonderful Lou, despite the frost much beautifying the branches on the trees of Boston Commons. Today has been a rather uneventful one. It's hardly worth writing a letter over, but you must indulge me, as I miss you in the most foolish way possible. After supper, my darling John and I spent an hour with some of his acquaintances chatting and having a very stupid time. For if there's any one thing I do dislike, it is idle prattling with people I do not care for. I'd much rather be alone. Yet, when I agreed to marry him, I knew of John's fatal flaw, his affable nature, and ability to see good in whomever he meets. I am forever doomed to many more evenings of being sociable. My darling John has recently taught me cribbage, and he has yet to beat me. I hope he will not grow weary of me winning, but he doesn't seem to. He is very good-natured. We were such a silly pair, and I fell laughing, and worse, we were so jolly that I was afraid something bad would happen, for wise folks say that any usual mirthfulness is sure to be followed by some great misfortune. He's all that is good, so patient, so tender, so loving, so intent on making me happy, and a slew of other drivel and nonsense hardly worth burdening your ears with. Anna exits, and Louisa and Julian enter, carrying winter greenery. Louisa is reading a letter from Anna. And a slew of other drivel and nonsense hardly worth burdening your ears with? Anna wrote that? Well, what Anna wrote was less interesting. You know how I can't help but make everything that comes into my head and out my mouth more interesting? Lou, you must make yourself as much trouble to that young scallywag Julian Hawthorne in my absence. Beat him in as many races as possible and write riddles much cleverer than his. Well, you have appeased your sister on both counts. 
Sadly, she wrote nothing of the sort. Just some nonsense about giving you her love. Give her my love as well. Oh, and she wants to know, do you have any nonsense rhymes for her? I have one for all you Alcock girls about Bronson and Orchard House. Father and Apple Slim. Oh dear, you have my full attention. Julian pulls out a piece of paper. There once was a sage at Apple Slump, whose dinner never made him plump. Give him carrots, potatoes, squash, parsnips, and peas, some baked bread without any cheese, and a plate of raw apples to hold to his knees, and a glass of sweet cider to wash down all of these. And he'd pray to the spirit as long as you please, the airy sage of Apple Slump. Bravo! <laughs> Julian bows dramatically, then hands the paper to Louisa. She hands the paper back. Well, you must share that with May yourself. You do it. And include that to your letter to Anna, along with inquiring about John for me. He is well, I hope. Louisa stuffs the letter and rhyme into her coat pocket. Can he be anything but well, such an angel at his side? Will you ever forgive him for marrying your Anna? Perhaps. If he is as devoted a father to the baby as he is a husband, I will have little choice but to adore him. I could carry that tree bough for you, if you would like. I could carry that tree bow and you, if you would like. I'm sure you carry the whole world if Atlas would let you. I would like to see the world more than carry it. it has something to write about other than whatever nonsense is brewing in my head. We need more pine boughs, don't we? For the wreaths? We don't have to move the entire forest into your parlor, Lou. We can leave a few trees for the birds. Well, all right. But only because I saw a chickadee today, and he really was a cheerful little fellow flitting and fluttering around me, hopping from pine bough to pine bough until he scarpered off to Carol elsewhere. Honest and sociable birds, chickadees. Thoreau always liked them, didn't he? At school, Thoreau introduced us to all our neighbors at Walden Pond, the warblers and wrens, swallows and swifts. Wildflowers fed the spirit, he said. The earth isn't dead history, it's living poetry. We all miss him, Lou. Louisa examines their collected boughs. Winterberry. We need more, don't we? And I should like to get some juniper as well. These pine cones make a fine centerpiece for our parlor. Don't you think? Louisa. Louisa stops to pick up pine cones. John, besides committing the unforgivable crime of marrying Anna and carrying her off to Boston, is actually a wonderful gent. Although, I know you would marry all your sisters, Lou, if you could. You better keep an eye on May. Next time I come courting, you might not be so lucky. You haven't seen my French suitor. Bonjour, monsieur. You are no match for me in my fashionable and alluring Parisian ways. <laughs> I certainly can't compete. May does adore all things French. Although, you might end up married yourself if you aren't too careful. I'd rather be a free spinster and paddle my own canoe. We need you, don't we? There's a particularly handsome yew tree by the pond that might spare a few branches. May races in carrying a letter. She hands the letter to Louisa. Louisa opens it and reads it. Well? A note from Miss Stevenson. And what does she write? Does she have news? Is it about the war or herself? Who is Miss Stevenson and why does she write to you? Well, I will tell you when you stop bombarding me with questions. Well, if you could answer me faster than I come up with questions, I wouldn't have to ask you so many. I am to be a nurse at Georgetown at the Union Hotel Hospital. Georgetown, that's near Washington, DC. When? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? But that's the day after today. That's generally what tomorrow is thought of as. It's so soon. Soldiers can't put off dying to better suit your schedule, May. I have to leave today. I will escort you as far as Boston. And me too. I will have you as close as possible for as long as possible. Perhaps you two had better run to the house and get packing. Must we always run? I'll see to it that the screenery ends up in the parlor. Your country calls, Lou. Go on. Louisa exits, followed by May. Julian drags the greenery in the direction of Orchard House. End of scene. Act 1, Scene 3. Setting. Union Hotel Hospital, Georgetown, December 14th, 1862. Laundry room. At rise, Louisa is folding sheets with Lizzie. 
Are you certain you don't need to rest? I wouldn't want to miss out on the titillating and glamorous work of folding laundry. <laughs> There's certainly, there is certainly plenty of work to be done here of varying degrees of glamorousness. Well, then we will have to do it in a manner that is as glamorous as possible. These puritanical aprons and dowdy dresses certainly help one feel stylish, don't they? At least the bloodstains don't show up on black, Miss Alcott. I won't stand for any formalities. Louisa or Lou, please, Miss Thurber. Elizabeth. Or Lizzie. You're from Massachusetts, too? Concord. One of those dime a dozen small towns is of little consequence to the rest of the world, but is firmly entrenched in its unfounded belief that it's at the world's center. Julia enters carrying a basket of clothes. These garments are hardly worth salvaging. They're mostly mud, crusted blood, and the Lord knows what else. These boys have waded through hell and back. I've already found a dozen lice comfortably nestled in the sheet, and it's in the clean laundry pile. I would hate to see what flora and fauna are residing in the dirty sheets. I'm afraid the hospital is sorely infested, Miss Alcott. Louisa, please, or Lou. Julia. Miss Dix is very adamant about keeping the hospitals as clean and tidy as possible. Oh, Lord, Dragon Dix. We must not have comely nurses here at Union Hotel Hospital. The plainer, the better. You shall do nicely, girl, very nicely. Now for my rules, child. I do hope you are fond of rules. I certainly am. The more severe, arbitrary, and devoid of common sense, the better. Mindless bureaucracy is next to godliness, I always say. Do excuse me. I need to go shout at a nurse for no reason whatsoever, other than that I can. She means well. She doesn't mean well, but she means business, and that I respect. Miss Dix does prefer ugly nurses. Being scheduled for the daytime shift is not very complimentary to my good looks. She is the superintendent of women nurses for the Union Army. That's no easy task. Although I can't abide how she talks to Hannah Ropes, who is as sweet and dear hospital matron as any hospital could wish for. At least Dragon Dix is better than Dr. Fitzpatrick. But his experience from the Crimean War? And he is rather tall and handsome, wouldn't you say? I would rather he was shorter and plainer, and with a heart. Another one, the theatrics of Clara Barton have certainly gone to your sexes' heads. How can men get any real work done with women scampering about, fawning and fussing over trivialities such as clean bedding and wash floors? But I wouldn't expect you to understand. Science does show the female brain is significantly smaller, thus inferior. I do wish he would drink less before surgeries. Well, Dr. John is an entirely different matter. His indifference almost as intolerable as Dr. Fitzpatrick's hostility. At least he has had some medical training, unlike most of the surgeons here. Dr. Winslow is a Harvard man. Yes, which he reminds us constantly. Dr. John enters. Louisa does not see him. Julia and Lizzie do. Louisa begins to impersonate him. I am afraid I will exchange no pleasantries with you ladies as any kind of genial interactions are illogical and therefore unnecessary. I went to Harvard, which makes me terribly important. It means I don't have to exchange polite niceties with anyone. That man seems to think we need no more conversation than the furniture unless he needs something. So curt and abrupt. I am naturally irascible, and if I could shake him vigorously, the relief would be immense. Julia, would you be so kind as to assist me with an amputation? Although there is an antique oak stool that could hold my tray if you are otherwise engaged. Granted, it's certainly not as lively or helpful as you. Of course, Dr. Winslow. I'll assemble your tray for the operation. Julia exits. I'll see to these uniforms. Lizzie takes a basket of uniforms and exits. I am here to perform a duty, not engage in idle chit-chat. Men are dying all around us. It's hardly the time to worry about niceties. Your duty isn't just to treat typhoid or cut off poisoned limbs. More was damaged than just their bodies. Harvard Medical School covered the use of quinine for chills or opium for diarrhea. Healings men's hearts and souls aren't my area of expertise. You might try a good morning or a good afternoon, perhaps inquiring after how they are doing, small talk. I'm fiercely allergic to small talk. Well, I can help you there. 
Slow talk is my area of expertise. Miss. You don't remember my name? Shared it once, and I'm not of the mind to share it again. Uh, forgive me if I was otherwise engaged. I was removing shrapnel from a fellow's stomach when Hannah introduced you to me. Don't you have an amputation to get to? Go on. I don't require a parting salutation as I know you are allergic to such niceties. <laughs> you will have one all the same. Goodbye. Till we meet again, mystery nurse. Dr. John exits. End of scene. Act 1, scene 4. Union Hotel Hospital, Georgetown, December 18th, 1862. At rise, Anna, May, and Louisa enter, each writing a letter. My dearest Lou. Anna, darling. May, my love. It's snowy here. I spent a lazy afternoon reading an intriguing novel. I can imagine nothing more splendid than a soft bed and a nice book, and if I hadn't a virtuous idea that it was wasting time, I'm afraid I should often indulge. I've spent a very quiet evening, mostly in my own little room, absorbed in my own little affairs, writing to you, dear Lou. It's what I enjoy best if I cannot be in your presence. Birds are certain to migrate to our parlor soon, to build nests. For Julian has decked the place with so much greenery. He showed up this morning with some holly, and I arranged them around a lamp on our table, and it looks as fine as anything in Mr. Emerson's dining room. I have enclosed a rough sketch. He also brought me mistletoe, which I haven't the faintest idea what to do with. I will do a watercolor of it tomorrow, perhaps. I think, even with our parlor transformed into a winter wonderland, Orchard House is more like the sight of a wake without Lou. The sun has left Concord, Anna. A fancy ball had once been held here for George Washington, but now the Popeyan style mural is all that remains of any refinement. Hurley Burley House, I call it, is the most perfect pestilence box in existence. The ballroom has partitioned wards of iron beds, lined up in neat rows. The men have survived Antietam. Now they must survive the hospital. We run the gauntlet of disease here from pneumonia to camp itch. Disorder, discomfort, bad management have reduced things to a condition which I despair of describing. Christmas without Lou. I am so glad you'll be here to endure it with me. I took a rather chilly walk around the commons. Usually I'm in my head, but today I was out of it altogether, just looking, really, observing. And the commons seemed strange, almost as if I had never seen them before, as if I was seeing them for the first time, as if I weren't myself, but a bystander, a creature of another world discovering them. Julie and I ice skated on the pond yesterday. It was so bright and sunny, I could hardly believe the whole world is frozen over. Sky and pond white. I am certain I saw a cardinal, but Julian thought it was a sparrow. But I was so adamant he changed his opinion and is certain it was a cardinal, too. It floated away so quickly. A flash of red in the naked arms of the trees. The stench from the overpowering, festering wounds and bodily waste is unbearable. I continue to do my early morning runs here. I trot up and down the streets in all directions, sometimes to the heights, halfway to Washington, again to the hill, over which the long train of army wagons are constantly vanishing and ambulance is appearing. There has been a battle, Fredericksburg. I was awakened last night. I looked out my window to see all the horse-drawn carts, loaded with bodies stretching far into the darkness, the wounded from Fredericksburg. Hurley Burley House, already overcrowded, now has more bodies than furniture. Broken bodies on the floor leaned against the walls. I must confess, my ardor experienced a sudden chill and I indulged in a most unpatriotic wish that I was safe at home again. A defeat, a terrible defeat for the Union. All hands were on deck all last night and today. My feet are worn away, I'm certain. I write to you, then I will indulge in a few hours of precious sleep. Night and stillness take my place, filling this great house of pain with the healing miracles of sleep and his diviner brother, Death. How oh, I... I dearly, oh, I miss you. miss you. 
Oh, my love. Your doting and devoted sister. Your troubled yet still mysterious imp of a sister. Anna. May. Louisa. Act 1, Scene 5. Setting. Union Hotel Hospital, Georgetown, December 19th, 1862. At rise, Louisa near Robert, who is resting. Robert is missing a leg. His right arm is gravely wounded. Julia enters with a tray. Tourniquets, scalpel, knife, bone saws, suitors, and bandages. Is this thing in an amputation? No, you are. Julia sets the tray down on a table near Louisa. Oh, good. You could assist me with emptying bedpans. No, no, I'll stick to holding the poor sod's hand or whatever else I can do. I'll see you at dinner. Watching limbs get sawed off and emptying chamber pots really whets the appetite, doesn't it? I'm starving. I was too busy changing sheets to get any lunch. I do hope they are serving stale bread with a dash of weevils again. We're lucky there might be that lukewarm brown beverage that vaguely resembles coffee. You are welcome to crackers again if the rats in my quarters have left me any. I might take you up on that. Julia hands Louise the tray. I have some unfinished business with Robert, then I'll be ready to report for duty. Right. Those bedpans won't empty themselves. If they aren't emptied on schedule, Dragon Dix's temper will be worse than anything I'll find in those buckets. I wouldn't be so certain. Julia exits. Lizzie enters. Louisa, there is a Confederate soldier here at Union Hospital. The tall fellow, beard like a burning bush shot in the foot. Most likely we'll lose the leg. Yes, I've seen him. (sighs) Taking a perfectly good bed from one of our boys. Hannah says that we have to treat him just as well as one of our own. I found him to be a disappointment. He's neither fiendish or romantic or pathetic or anything interesting whatsoever. There's something about him, perhaps a glint in his eyes, that's devilish. Mark my words. Perhaps some of our boys have devilish glints all their own, Lizzie. A patient told me after Fredericksburg, he, along with most of our boys, gave the houses a considerable rummage until they were ordered to stop. Looting? And the old boy, he wanted me to have these earrings, a cluster of grapes. You took them? Louisa takes earrings from an apron pocket. I don't want to take any part in looting, but the poor fellow had a broken leg. I see. You won't tell anyone, Lizzie. Lizzie? Not a word. Lizzie, promise? Uh, Where's Julia? I I need to help her changing bandages. Promise me, Lizzie. Fine. Yes. Not a soul. Thank you. Julia's emptying bedpans. I'll see if I can get some recovered patients to assist. I wager Julia wouldn't mind some reinforcements. Lizzie exits. Louisa crosses over to Robert. You've cleaned up well. Like your shirt, quite stylish. All the fashionable people are wearing them. That's true. Typhus and no toes are in them, aren't they? You must stop calling your neighbors by their ailments, little sergeant. Write the letter. Your scribe awaits your dictations. Couldn't we hear some more of that Mr. Dickens? Couldn't we write that letter? Mr. Dickens might put me in a letter-writing mood, Miss Alcott. Louisa pulls out a worn, much-abused copy of Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. Chapter 13 Strongly illustrative of the position and that the course to true love is not a railway. Yes, Mr. Tupman at Dingley Dell with Miss Wardle. The spinster aunt took up a large watering pot, which lay in one corner, was about to leave the arbor. Mr. Tupman detained her and drew her to a seat beside him. Miss Wardle, he said he, you're an angel. Mr. Tupman, exclaimed Rachel blushing as red as the watering pot itself. Where else could I hope to find so rare a combination of excellence and beauty, professed Mr. Tupman. Mr. Tupman sunk upon his knees at her feet. Oh, Rachel, he seized her passive hand, and the watering pot fell to the ground as he pressed it to his lips. Oh, Rachel, say you love me. Mr. Tupman, said the spinster aunt with averted head. I can hardly speak the words, but, but... You were not wholly indifferent to me. Louisa closes the book. Now, Miss Alcott, that's the right poor place to cut off reading. Well, we'll discover Miss Wardle's response to Mr. Tubman's declarations 
just as soon as I'm finished transcribing that letter. I have nothing to say to Miss Jane. You fought valiantly through six scrimmages and lost a leg. You have a great deal to write about. You read those parts of Miss Warble and Mr. Tubman like a fine actress, Miss Alcott. Compliments will get you nowhere, although they are duly noted. Miss Jane has the best laugh. Some folks think it's odd as though it's her nose, but it's mighty cute, I say. Miss Jane sews uneven loose stitches, but it's lively a conversation. Like you, Miss Alcott. Miss Jane can tie knots real tight like a sailor. Miss Jane can't really bake, but bothers bread to perfection. It's been nothing but Miss Jane since you arrived. She's either a goddess or an angel, though I'd wager she's both. I wouldn't know where to start. Dearest darling, Miss Jane, it's me, your ever-devoted Robert. I'm not her Robert anymore. They didn't take your senses, just your leg. You're most certainly still her Robert. No, I'm not. I weren't a bad-looking chap before. Perhaps you're a little worse for wear, but you are still the darling man that she adores, I'm certain. Who said anything about anyone adoring anyone else? You read too many novels. You don't read enough. I would, if you had a mind to read them to me instead of all this writing letters nonsense. I'm certain she won't think any less of you for being a little less in the legs department. A wound is the best decoration a brave soldier can wear. I need to rest for a while. I can't indefinitely let your poor Jane suffer. I'm certain she's anxiously awaiting to hear from you. Not today. Please. No, not today. Dr. John enters. Good afternoon, Robert. Good afternoon, Dr. Winslow. You need a hand with anything? I still have two to give. Not for long. The right one will have to go. Just to the elbow. Not today, but soon, most likely. How are you feeling today, Robert? I just need some rest, sir. Right. Well, I'll let you get to it. Dr. John and Louise will leave Robert to rest. Not even a good afternoon. Where you go, good afternoons don't follow. I applaud your timing. Really masterfully done. Is it ever a good time to tell someone they're going to lose their arm? Robert's had a particularly rough morning. I've removed one arm, made rounds with the pneumonia, diphtheria, and typhoid patients, and removed more shrapnel than I care to count this morning. There are no shortages of rough mornings here. I was trying to be sociable, as instructed. Perhaps you should learn when to stay silent. First, I don't talk enough, and now too much. So I should speak less and more simultaneously? Perhaps don't talk at all. I didn't like you better when we were less acquainted. I will work on my tining and leave delivering delicate news to you, Miss Louisa May Alcott. Good detective work. Lizzie told me. Yes, I imagine she did, Dr. John. No one calls me Dr. John. I do. Does that mean I'm no one to you? All that bonding we did yesterday in the diphtheria ward really meant nothing to you? Or do you visit diphtheria patients with all the nurses? That I do. You were very thorough yesterday, bathing all those soldiers. I'm just doing my duty. Washing all those naked men. It's really not proper. Neither is sawing off limbs. Might I change the subject? Yes, you might if you would like to not be another casualty of this damn war. The Pickwick Papers. You're a Dickens fan. Guilty as charged. Nice subject change. Thank you. That fawn skin dappled hair of hers and the blue eye dear and dewy and that infantine fresh air of hers to think men cannot take you sweet and enfold you, ay, and hold you and so keep you what they make you sweet. I'm more of a Robert Browning man. Isn't there enough suffering here without you copiously quoting Robert Browning? You don't like Robert Browning? Correct. You'll love me yet, and I can tarry. Your love's protracted growing. June reared that bunch of flowers you carry from seeds of April's sowing. I plant a heartful now, some seed, at least is sure to strike, and yield what you'll not pluck indeed. Not love, but maybe like. Still don't like Robert Browning. Perhaps I might loan you my copy of Men and Women. How many times do I have to tell you I don't like Robert Browning? How much Robert Browning have you read? Enough. How much is enough? Enough. 
What about the poetry anthology, Men and Women? What about it? Have you read it? From your silence, I ascertain that you haven't. Why don't you borrow my copy? Must I? If you don't warm up to it, you can make fun of it as much as you like. And that includes doing impersonations of me quoting it. That is tempting. I fancy I'm better at impersonating you quoting Browning than you are quoting Browning yourself. Is that a yes? I suppose I can make acquaintance with your copy of Men and Women. Granted, it doesn't get grand ideas. It doesn't mind being casually perused, although I'm certain on closer inspection you'll want to read it thoroughly. Very thoroughly. It's a real page turner. I'm looking for something to help me sleep. Fine, fine. Send your dull poetry anthology my way before I come to my senses. Right. I'm afraid I must cut our discussion short. I am persistent in the amputation. Yes, right. Me. Assist me in an amputation. You're quite certain you would like to. It's a lower leg, below the knee. I hate lower legs. You hate all amputations. I hate all amputations. I can ask Julia. She might like a respite from emptying chamber pots. No, no, I'll come. If I'm called to a field hospital, I want to be ready to serve. Are you doing anything this evening? Maybe standing around chatting with you and not assisting in an amputation at the rate we're moving. Are you otherwise engaged this evening, Louisa? Well, after this, I'm trotting about giving out rations, cutting up food, washing faces, making beds, sweeping floors. After that? Then I'm dressing wounds, sewing bandages, brushing up and down after pillows, sponges, reading books, writing letters. And after that? After that, I was hoping to get a few hours of sleep, or I have to get up and do it all over again. Would you like to come down to the body room? We're having a dissection. You're asking me to a dissection? Yes. When I said, get to know the men better, this is not what I meant. For science. It's all rather intriguing. I'm sure it is. I'll pass. I'm not keen on seeing the inner workings of anyone I know. I'm not very good at this. Dissections? No, I'm very good at dissections. No, never mind. The amputation. Yes, the amputation. I hear for dinner tonight we are having a crumbly substance they liberally refer to as bread. From what I'm told is most definitely not horse, but is still dubiously referred to as meat. Care to join me? I look forward to it. Louisa picks up a tray of implements and exits with Dr. John. End of scene. One, scene six. The woods near Walden Pond, December 18th. May and Julian enter carrying their ice skates. You are right. Skating did me good. Please accept my coat. And let you freeze to death. That wouldn't be very chivalrous of me, now would it? No. The brisk air will do me some good. The air around Walden Pond, it has its own quality, doesn't it? We met here. We did, didn't we? Somehow I never think of us as meeting. It's as if you've always been here, like that old oak tree stump covered in moss or the stones on the beach, perfect for skipping. We had just moved to Concord, to Wayside. I was wandering about the woods, the summer heat bearing down on me. In a brooding, introspective manner, I'm sure. You popped out from behind a poplar tree, like a wild wood nymph, and you said, what do you think of boys and girls bathing together? I did. You did. <laughs> and you didn't reply at all, I wager. I have improved my ability to reply to you. You were terribly shy. And so insufferably, Im so, so insufferably polite. I think you did reply. You said you hadn't given the subject much thought. Yes. Yes, I did. And you replied that splashing about in the pond was no end of fun, and you would be willing to try boys and girls bathing together if I would like to come with you and your sisters to Walden Pond. Then you took my hand and led me here, telling me everything there was to know about Concord, its inhabitants, including the Alcott sisters. I think after sharing the contents of your life story in full, you inquired after my name and shared your own. And that was the beginning of the end. 
Little did you know what you'd be signing up for that fateful day you made acquaintance with the Alcott sisters. It's strange how the sun can be so bright, yet it can be so cold here. It is awfully beautiful, isn't it? Yes, very beautiful. <clears throat> the ancient Celts believed in, in thin places, places where the spiritual worlds and ours were closer. I've always felt like Walden Pond could be one of those places. Yes, yes it could. Another letter arrived from Little. And you haven't yet shared the contents with me? I was going to tonight at Mr. Emerson's. I am more than happy to indulge in Lou's letters multiple times. Her letters improve with subsequent readings. Moncure Conway, the co-editor of the Boston Commonwealth, has been attending the readings and has taken a keen interest in Lou's letters. As he should. I know no other person who can make writing about a hospital as amusing as Lou. She applauded your whimsical poem about the hanging festive greenery, declared it amusing to no end, and requested that for your troubles of mastery of language, I give you a kiss. Lou, she gets wild ideas. Yes, very wild ideas. May opens the letter. She had to comfort a poor drummer boy. This Irish lad had been carried to the hospital by a Prussian gentleman, saving the boy from freezing to death on the battlefield. And when the Prussian died, the boy was inconsolable. I didn't know a human being could make such a sound, Lou writes. She wrapped the boy in her shawl and rocked him gently. He said she was real motherly which delighted Lou to no end. Mothering was never Lou's strong suit. Remember her dolls? Half-dressed, missing limbs. I never saw dolls in such a sorry state. And she does go on about how terrible the food is. <sighs> Poor Lou. She is in dire need of some good cheer. You have a poem for her, or a riddle, perhaps? I do indeed. Julian pulls a riddle from his pocket. You twirl and leap with me, even though I am as thin as a knife's edge. We are flying even when we are on earth. In winter, you adore me. In summer, you ignore me. You tie me too tight. An ice skate. That last bit about tying it too tight gives it away, you think? Keep it. Lou does tie her skates too tight. Then she makes such a fuss when she can't get them off again. I have another. The universe is born. Father Time holds his breath. Walls and ceilings become sky. The earth erupts in joy, spreading light. A sunrise beneath your eyes. That one is tricky. Your smile. A smile. I'll, I'll work on it. It needs some work. It's... Rubbish, really, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not very good at riddles. I like it, as it is. I'll include the ice skate one for Lou, certainly, although she'll be wild with jealousy to know we've been ice skating without her. Please take my jacket. Seeing you shiver would be far worse than being a tad chilly. Besides, now you can lord over me for being right about being underdressed for our outing. I would prefer you to be warm than to be right. Perhaps we should head back. Julian holds out his arm. I can walk back without assistance. Perhaps I require assistance? All right, as I'm in a gallant mood. May and Julian exit arm in arm. End of scene. Act one, scene seven. Setting, a garish mansion. At rise, Pauline enters, carrying a letter. She hurriedly opens it and reads, Gilbert enters, speaking the letter. My wild goddess, my knightly nymph, 
My perfection on earth. Pauline, six months ago I left you, promising to return and take you home, my wife. I loved you, but I deceived you, for though my heart was wholly yours, my hand was not mine to give. This it was that haunted me through all that blissful summer. I am married, and there all ends. Hate me, forget me, and leave my punishment to remorse and time. Gilbert. Gilbert exits. Pauline paces to and fro like a wild creature in its cave, bent head, locked hands, and restless steps. Some mental storm, swift and sudden as a tempest of the tropics, had swept over her and left its marks behind. I will show Gilbert the creature he deserted is no longer poor, unknown, unloved, but lifted higher than himself, cherished, honored, applauded, her life one of royal pleasure, herself a happy queen. Beauty, grace, and talent I possess. Wealth gives them luster. Rank exalts them. Power makes them irresistible. I shall have fame, fortune, rank, splendor, and power. I shall have my revenge. If only I knew a deliciously handsome, fabulously wealthy, much younger and naive man that was desperately in love with me. Manuel enters. He is deliciously handsome, rich, and totally into Pauline, like really. Pauline! Manuel! Forgive me. I saw Dolores bring a letter. You vanished. An hour passed. I could wait no longer. And I came. I'm glad. I needed my one friend. Read that. Pauline gives Manuel the letter. He reads it. With a gesture of wrathful contempt, Manuel flings the letter. Traitor! Shall I kill him? Pauline laughs low to herself, a dreary sound, with a slow darkening of a face that gives her words an ominous <laughs> Why should you? Such revenge is brief and paltry. There are fates more terrible than death, weapons more keen than poniards, more noiseless than pistols. Leave Gilbert to remorse. And me. I've learned to read the language of your eyes, Manuel. I find that the boy has grown into the man, the friend warmed into the lover. Your youth has kept me blind too long. Your society has grown dear to me. Manuel, do you love me? I would die for you. Listen, Manuel, if you think that this loss has broken my heart, undeceive yourself. I have shed no tears, uttered no cry since I read that letter. I am not one to lament long over any hopeless sorrow. Contempt has killed, not, has killed my love. I have buried it, and no power can make it live again. Here is my hand, and that hand is yours. See, I offer it. Take all I have, fortune, name, and my poor self. Use us as you will. We are proud and happy to be spent for you. Do you mean it? Am I to go with you? To be near you always, to call you wife? and know we are each other's until death. What have I ever done to earn a fate like this? Make me what you will, for soul and body, I am wholly yours henceforth. Manuel. Pauline. They stare at each other enraptured. Pauline leads Manuel off stage suggestively, and the setting shifts back to Union Hospital. Louise enters. Reading a letter, Julia enters with a basket of bed linens. Unkard News? A.M. Barnard News. A.M. Barnard. Barnard writes blood and thunder tales, psychological thrillers, sprinkled with a touch of the gothic, a pinch of ill-fated romance, a heavy dose of revenge, a scoop of seduction with intrigue and murder folded in neatly, a smidgen of disguises taught with death and deceit. Goodness, that is not my recipe for desired reading. It might do you some good. Barnard's short story, Pauline's Passion, won a short story contest and a cash prize of $100. $100 for a short story? <laughs> Your Mr. Barnard must be ecstatic. Mr.? Oh yes, Barnard certainly is. Pauline's Passions will be published in Frank Leslie Illustrated newspaper. 
Frank Leslie Illustrated Newspaper. That's got quite a circulation. Well, A.M. Barnard's short story, Pauline's Passion, is circulation worthy. Pauline Valerie, a ravishingly beautiful scorned woman, is rejected by her lover, Gilbert Redman. She marries Manuel, a young man devoted to her, to take her revenge on Gilbert. In a quest for Gilbert's destruction, she brings about her own. Goodness. <laughs> I'm surprised you know anyone like this A.M. Barnard. I'm full of surprises. Don't mention this to Lizzie, will you? Lizzie enters with a basket of bandages. Mention what? Oh, we were just talking about the earrings. The one with the grape clusters. You were? We were? We were. Louisa, what are you going to do with them? Lizzie. I kept my promise. About as well as a politician. I didn't mention you by name exactly. Just a few details I added. For Flourish, mind you, might have given you away. I have not decided what to do with them, and please, Lizzie, be so good as to find another juicy tidbit of gossip to spread about. I don't particularly enjoy being today's headline news. A juicy tidbit just walked in. Oh. Johan enters. He sits at his bed. Lizzie motions to him. The three nurses watch him from a distance. Look what fell down from Mount Olympus. Louisa exits. He certainly is an Adonis, isn't he? Do you think he needs to be bathed? Lizzie. I'm a nurse. That's what I do. I, I bathe people. We can't just walk over there and bathe him. It's our job. That shirt. He really needs a clean shirt. He really needs to take off that shirt, doesn't he? He does. It's dirty, I mean. It's really dirty. I'll bathe him, and you get him a clean shirt. No, you get him a clean shirt, and I bathe him. Louisa enters. She has a bucket of water, a rag, and a clean shirt. She crosses over to him. Looks like someone's gone in for the charge. Julie and Lizzie exchange looks. They pretend to be sewing bandages, but are watching Louisa tend to Johan. Somehow the water in this bucket manages to be colder than it is outside. With the Potomac frozen, that doesn't sound particularly promising. Might I help you clean up a bit? I can manage. Perhaps let someone else manage for you this once? I can hardly say no to a lady such as yourself. I have been accused of many things, but being a lady, never. I'll forgive you, only don't make the mistake again. How ladylike of you. Perhaps you're more of a lady than you think. Perhaps. Let's start with the arm, shall we? Louisa proceeds to wash Johann's arms. You just arrived? From Fredericksburg. The battle ended days ago. I stayed behind. You volunteered? Men needed to get here, and they were in no state to walk themselves. Let's do your face, shall we? Louisa washes his face. See many skirmishes? First one, my lady. Louisa, Lou. Louisa. It suits you. You think? I always thought I was more of a Pauline. Right, the shirt. Johan takes off his shirt with much difficulty. The other nurses watch him intently. He's bandaged using makeshift bandages. Standing behind him, Louisa takes off his bandages to reveal his wounds. From her reactions, we can see his wounds on the back are quite extensive. Not sure I would call Fredericksburg a battle or a skirmish. I'm not sure what to call it. Burnside ordered the troops to storm a stone wall on Mary's Heights at noon. It started at noon. The Confederates were lined up, rows enforcing each other, passing up ready loaded weapons, handing them in front. It just rained, rained down bullets. Thousands dying by the hour. Burnside kept ordering us over. He didn't stop. My regiment got orders to charge at 2-3. The field was nothing but a blanket of bodies by that point. Nothing but limbs, broken corpses. The men, the wounded men, still living, grabbed our ankles, our legs. Lie down, lie down, you'll be killed, lie down. They pleaded on dying breaths. As we approached, a Confederate from behind the wall called for us to retreat. A boy's voice. 
disembodied through the smoke. Go back, please, just go back, he screamed. We didn't make it within 50 feet of that wall. A sheet of flame, that stone wall. When the hailstorm started, we fell into the thick mud, the earth as the bullets rained, pelting, pounding into the earth. Have you ever heard silence before? Yes, I suppose. I'd never heard silence. But that absence of screams, the pelting, pounding, the click of rifles, true silence and stillness. On the faces, the hands, the legs next to me. That stillness, the smell and the smoke moving through the air. Then more bodies, more bullets, more bodies, more bullets, more bodies, more bullets. I should get a doctor to look at this. Julia? Julia exits to find the doctor. Michael, my brother, his division was ordered to charge an open field in Prospect Hill that morning. The boys called it the slaughter pen. The Confederates did nothing but rain down artillery on them as they charged, snipers shooting down the survivors from the trees. I didn't find him, Louisa. I didn't find him. After two years of fading, my little sister, Elizabeth, died at three in the morning. Scarlet fever. She slept the day before and at midnight became unconscious, quietly breathing her life away till three. And with one last look of her beautiful eyes, she was gone. I'm so sorry about Michael. I'm sorry about your Elizabeth. I would have gone straight into Hades after her. I wager Orpheus's harp was not nearly as entertaining as your wit. Thank you. Johan. Louisa. Julia enters with Dr. John. Dr. John goes to Johan, shaking his hand. John Winslow. Johan Sure. Uh, may I? Johan nods. Dr. John examines his back. Your back certainly took a beating, didn't it? My breathing hasn't been so good, sir. Right. Well, let's take a closer look at you. Dr. John examines Johan's back. There seems to be a bullet lodged in your chest, a third in your shoulder, and another. Yes, well, another. I'll see if I can get these out. Why don't I? Uh, Julia, you mind fetching me some forceps? And a bullet scoop? Yes, yes, that too. Bullet extractor, bullet screw, bullet probe? The Eldridge probe, preferably, not the Nelson. Bandages? You know what I need better than I do. Go on. Of course, Dr. Winslow. Hello, Mr. Sewer. Johan, please. Hello, Johan. I didn't get a hello. I gotta come here this instant. Julia exits. Well, I'm gonna see what shrapnel I can get out of you. It's nasty business. I'm pretty inflamed at this point. Uh, let me know if it's unbearable, won't you? Julia re-enters with the tray containing various implements. Perhaps I better let you get to it. No, please stay, Lou. I insist. Dr. John, standing behind Johan, motions to him. I could give you a hand. Me too. Don't you have patients waiting for their bedding to be changed in the pneumonia ward? Julia picks up a laundry basket to Johan. Goodbye, Johan. We'll be back to check on you later. Thanks for the warning. Go on. Goodbye, Johan. Lizzie and Julia exit. What about me? I don't get any goodbyes. <laughs> right, well, let's dive in, shall we? Dr. John tends to Johan's wounds. Louisa sits by John. Louisa takes Johan's hand. He is grateful. Dr. John finishes bandaging up the wound. You think I'll pull through, sir? I hope so. Lou. Louisa and Dr. John cross away from Johan. Dr. John proceeds to wipe down his hands. That ball pierced the left lung, broke a rib, and did no end of damage here and there. Every breath he draws must be like getting stabbed. Any kind of rest is impossible, poor fellow. Lying on a wounded back while slowly suffocating to death. I'd wager he's suffering more than anyone in this dilapidated nightmare. See to it that he ceased his affairs ties up loose ends, sends out letters, all the rest. 
today, if possible. You don't think he'll die, do you? Bless you, Lou, but there's not the slightest hope for him. You'll tell him, won't you? Me, but it's Christmas Eve. So you'd rather tell him on Christmas? No. Then get it over with. I'm sure you'll find a way. You're better at this sort of thing, right? We established that, didn't we? Yes, but... There's my Lou. That's a shoulder. Oh, did you ever figure out what to do about those earrings? Lizzie told you, didn't she? Who didn't Lizzie tell? Dr. John exits. Louisa gets letter writing materials and crosses over and sits near Johan. I thought we might write some letters. I'm sure you have other duties to attend to. No duty more pressing than this. Doctor's orders. Dr. Winslow doesn't think I'll pull through, does he? Dr. Winslow is wrong about a great many things, so let's hope this is one of them. He is wrong. Should we make this to mother or wife? Neither, my lady. I don't have a wife, and I'll write to my mother myself when I'm recovered. The letter is just precautionary. Not worth wasting the paper. To humor me, then? No need to worry her. Right. What if I make myself a terrible bother until you submit to my request? I can't imagine that working on two accounts. Firstly, I'm terribly stubborn. And secondly, your company is anything but bothersome. I am quite skilled in the fine art of being a terrible nuisance, I warn you. I believe it. Fine, you win this round. Enjoy your Christmas Eve, but you haven't seen the last of me. I hope not. Louisa exits. End of scene. One, scene eight. The woods around Walden Pond. A snowy afternoon. December 24th. Anna enters with May. I don't see why you want to be tramping about in the snow. Oh, you can pay a visit to Walden Pond every day if you like. But I don't have you every day, and now I must share you with the old oaks and evergreens. I miss strange things about Walden. How a plain sheet of snow conceals the surface from our eyes, masking a pond, except where the wind has swept the ice bare. In the summer, a hushed music seems to murmur across the surface. Being here, seeing the changes is almost like being with John. Seeing him, knowing his mind, watching him like oaks turning scarlet in fall. Like patterns of snowflakes, there is an infinite depth to how he continues to delight and amaze me. He changes while still staying my John. How splendid. I'm glad that John isn't disagreeable to you. Lou hasn't forgiven him for stealing you from us. Oh, nonsense. Nothing could steal me from you. You'll have me all to yourself this Christmas, and John won't stand in the way. He knows better. Thank you. How will we manage Christmas without Lou? Oh, we'll manage. We'll just have to sing merrily and slightly off-key the entire day in her honor and make the best of it. No one feels like celebrating Christmas. The Battle of Fredericksburg was a soul-sickening slaughter, a murder ground. What is there to be jolly about? Look. Look there. Hopping about in that old oak. He's a cocky little fellow, isn't he? Is that a finch? I fancy that's a cardinal. Oh, it's not nearly red enough. A lady cardinal. The size? A small cardinal. See the formation of the tail? No. That, that is a finch, surely. Julian and I have seen loads of cardinals. Oh, have you now? How is Julian? When he's not bird spotting with you? He's well, I suppose. And becoming quite handsome. Who told you that? A little bird. A little bird that is certainly a cardinal and not a finch? Yes, that bird. He's not particularly handsome. So, he's unhandsome? No, I wouldn't say he's unhandsome. So he's both unhandsome and handsome. That's like hot ice and strange snow. Like moonlight rippling on water. Not only does the light evoke a sense of beauty and wonder of being outside yourself, of losing yourself for a moment to something greater. Something sublime. He's striking, not handsome. He evokes wonder. I see. 
That is altogether different than merely being handsome. Yes. Handsome is so common. Leading men in loose romances are handsome. Schoolgirl crushes were handsome. Stage actors are handsome. John is a stage actor. Yes, I know. John is handsome, then? He's had awful good luck standing under the mistletoe in the parlor. So have I, coincidentally. (laughs) There are other words more fitting to describe Julian. Well, I will tweet back to my winged friend that she heard incorrectly and that I have it on good authority that Julian is awe-inspiring. You will see him for yourself, and then you can decide. Oh, I will. Now let's head back to the house. I'm an icicle. Whose idea was it to freeze to death on an Arctic expedition? Yours? At Orchard House, when the feeling returns to our frozen limbs, you can show me your work. I must see your new drawings. Oh, I have some new still lives, mostly pine cones with a few sprigs of you. I have a really fine sketch of that mistletoe Julian gave us. That sprig that John hung in the parlor. Frank found associations of that mistletoe. Hanging that was a joint effort on John and my part. Oh, so you told John to hang it, and he did? Yep. That basically summarizes many of John and my joint efforts. I know. I'm quite certain that was a cardinal. Yes, May. May and Anna exit. End of scene seven. Act one, scene nine. The Alcott Parlor and Union Hotel Hospital, Christmas Eve. At rise, Anna enters. Dear Slu, the baby has done nothing but kick, roll about, and make a terrible fuss. Must be a girl. And if it is, as I suspect, I will name her after you. Louisa is a fine name for a girl. All my favorite people are named Louisa. Christmas Eve doesn't feel like Christmas Eve without you. Like crackling, roaring Yule log that gives off no heat. The fire burns, yet strangely cold. We all miss you terribly, but are trying to rally our spirits as we know we wish that we would. And I can't imagine what you suffer as you carry on in that hellhole. Pains me daily that I'm not there to waddle and squawk over you like a mother duck, covering you with my wings, protecting you from any perceived threats. Yet, I can think of no greater gift to our boys than having you at Christmas. We're terribly proud of you, you know? Have a Merry Christmas, and may your year ahead be as bright, brilliant, and as beautiful as you, my beloved sister. Anna, May, Julian sing Silent Night, while elsewhere, Louisa, Lizzie, and Julia sing Silent Night with the wounded men. End of Act One.
Act two, scene one, setting, Union Hotel Hospital, Christmas Day. The hospital is decorated with garlands and evergreen wreaths at rise. Julia and Lizzie enter. Lizzie has a bucket of rags, Julia a bag of letters and packages. Fine dinner. Hardly. There wasn't nearly enough turkey or pies to go around. Just enough to whet the appetite. There was enough applesauce at least. I wonder if President Lincoln will visit today. He does visit the hospitals from time to time. I would like to wish him a Merry Christmas. Perhaps you'll get the chance. You better get to cleaning the floors in case he shows up. We can't have him stepping on vomit now, can we? I do wish they would aim into the buckets better. Lizzie and Julia exit. Louisa enters. She crosses over to Johan. Johan! You're back. See? No fountain pen, no ink, no paper. I'm only here bearing Yuletide cheer. We would be having afternoon tea at this point. Fruitcake stolen. George and Joanna would be starting to eat the can from off the tree. Gingerbread does taste particularly delicious off a Christmas tree. Mother and I don't mind. The tree still has strands of popcorn and red berries, paper chains, candles, and red ribbons to recommend it. My sister May used to put the funniest tidbits on our tree. Pine cones, sprigs of winter berries, bird's nests, once a goose feather. Anything she found on walks, really. <coughs> That's a nasty cough. A uh, sympathy cough. That cough sounds unsympathetically real to me. It's nothing, see? All gone. Edward Schrock, the captain of my regiment, visited me today. That was good of him. He's written to my mother. Did he? He told her that I fought bravely and was wounded that I do not fully understand the severity of my own condition. Really? He was strongly urged to write to her by a nurse on his previous visit. Previous visit. A nurse? An attractive, lively girl with an abundance of wit. He's attractive. Maybe it was pretty. Both pretty and attractive, I wager. Louisa. Well, if I see a pretty and attractive, lively girl with an abundance of wit around here, I'll thank her for you, shall I? Louisa, I am not going to die. Doctors believe otherwise. You are mistaken. Write to your mother. Thank her. Tell her you love her. Today? As soon as possible, Johan. That night, the 133rd sent out squads to recover wounded and killed men. But the Confederate sharpshooters, they kept shooting. I watched men's breath white in the wintry air cease, their chests rise and fall, then stiffen to corpses, frigid like the hard frozen earth. I rolled corpses together. I hid under their dead bodies from the fire that never stopped. My father, he's gone, and now Michael, Joanna, George, my mother. I can't leave them alone. Lizzie enters. Robert's asking for you. Yes, of course. Lizzie exits. You're terribly stubborn, aren't you? I am. We'll have to pray that your mulishness will be enough for you to pull through, won't we? Yes, we will. Louisa crosses over to Robert Bain. Merry Christmas, little sergeant. Not particularly. Typhus has slept most of the afternoon. And no toes was discharged and replaced by shot in the stomach, who has done nothing but sleep also. You promised you'd read more Pickwick papers. If there is time. It's Christmas. There should always be time for Dickens at Christmas. Well said and quite right. Now. Louisa gives her a worn copy of the Pickwick papers. Chapter 28. A good humored Christmas chapter. Christmas was close at hand in all his bluff and hearty honesty. It was a season of hospitality, merriment, and open-heartedness. The old year was preparing like an ancient philosopher to call his friends around him and amidst the sound of feasting and revelry to pass gently and calmly away. And numerous indeed are the hearts to which Christmas brings a brief season of happiness and enjoyment. How many recollections does- Julia enters and crosses over to Louisa. A letter for your little sergeant. From mother, so soon. Lou, read it, will you? Let's see. Louisa opens the letter. 
Robert Bain, I managed to wrestle your address from your mother. Don't blame the dear woman, I was relentless. You are the only one to blame. If you are still alive, I have the mind to finish you off myself. How dare you? If you think that losing your leg will release you of your promises to me, you are sorely mistaken. I have plenty of legs. I'm certain we can manage well with three. I can live without your leg, but to live without you. You cruel, unfeeling man, don't die on me. If you dare to, I shall find you in heaven and make such a racket we will surely be thrown out. It's better for you to atone yourself and beg for forgiveness than carry on in this foolish fashion. I expect to hear from you presently, and considering the loss of your leg and all, and inclined to be very merciful for all the suffering you've inflicted on me. You selfish, foolish man. I love you deeply and dearly, right soon, or else. Yours and only ever yours, Jane. Right. Right. Louisa gets up and gets paper and ink and a pen. I should like to write it myself. I have to get used to using my left hand. Yes, yes, of course. Louisa gives the items to Robert, then walks away, leaving him to work. Dr. John enters. Dr. John? Uh, must you call me that? I could call you Dr. Quotes Browning too much. Not anymore. I've been cured. Do you have any engagements this evening? Mostly to sing more carols boisterously and slightly off key. I had hoped that you got that out of your system this morning. Certainly not. Can one ever get bellowing festive tunes out of their system? I have never been inflicted with the desire to sing Christmas carols. I should imagine not. Singing Christmas carols is not rational in the least, is it? Well, after you have sang your heart out, I thought perhaps we might retire to discuss Browning in my room. Your room? Yes. I feel we could have a lively exchange in private. About Browning? Yes. Well, I have given your poet a go, and honestly, I find him to be lacking. Lacking? Not to my taste, a bit too full of himself. Conceit spoils the finest genius. He's better than that Dickens you carry around. You don't need to pronounce his name like it's a disease. Dickens, the much beloved and respected author. Respected by who? He's silly and sentimental. Respected by silly and sentimental people then, I suppose. Like you. Yes, like me. You'll have to forgive me. This morning I assisted in an amputation where the man died in shock because Dr. Fitzpatrick is certain ether is unnecessary. I just helped a man with a few hours to live write his last letter to his wife and five children. And today is a good day. It's Christmas. So forgive me if I indulge in literature that contains a glimmer of human goodness while in a quagmire of despair. Sorry that my finding a whimsy and laughing at the absurdity of life is distasteful to you. I do apologize. Being jolly has always suited me, whereas incessant death, misery, and pain might be more pleasing to your palate. It's real, isn't it? It's the truth. It's not sentimental in the least. I've just found melancholia to be too depressing and it does keep one in bed. But don't imagine that I forget for a second where I am. This place is hell. Hell, I just... I just go armed to battle with this. Holds up her dickens. Like the silly, sentimental woman I am. Has anyone ever told you that you have a frightful temper? Everyone who's ever met me. I think you're being a tad unfair. It wasn't about fairness, it was about feelings, mine. Which are things that I have, divorced from reason or fairness. You should try coming in contact with yours. We can't all survive here by hiding behind banter and witticisms. My heart doesn't beat any less than yours just because I don't have something amusing to say about each pang. Excuse me. I'm going to be silly and sentimental and sing until my throat hurts. Enjoy your evening, rambling browning to a blank wall or whatever it is you do. Solace in poetry is better than locking yourself in a fortress made of your own wit, Lou. Perhaps I'll stop by your room later. Throw that copy of Browning at your head. It's all that book is good for knocking some sense into you. He had a gangrious wound on the shoulder. He certainly wasn't 18, maybe 12. I couldn't stay to hold his hand. I had to go to cut off some poor soul's leg. I had to leave him to die alone. 
on Christmas morning. I'm really doing my best, Lou. You're a very fine surgeon. Raising your voice is unkind and unnecessary. Whatever you have to say to me, say it without working yourself up into such a frightful rage. Yes, all right. I have quite a temper. Yes, I discerned as much. I don't entirely dislike you, Dr. John. I don't entirely dislike you either. I can hardly speak the words, but... I believe I'm not wholly indifferent to you. If you had read the Pickwick Papers, then maybe you would have gotten that reference. I'll have to rectify that. Since you did read that Robert Browning in entirety, I will give you your Mr. Dickens another try. Merry Christmas, Lou. Merry Christmas, Dr. John. Louisa exits, end of scene. Act two, scene two, the Alcott Parlor, Christmas day. Anna enters with Julian escorting her. I'm quite capable of walking on my own, Julian. I'm pregnant, not infirm. You wouldn't deprive me of the great pleasure of, pleasure of assisting you. Well, don't give John any ideas. I've only recently cured him of thinking that he is my servant. Since the baby's conception, he has been at my beck and call, waiting on my hand and foot constantly without provocation. It's quite tiresome. Your loveliness and good character are to blame for why those around you can't help but dote on you in excess. Julian helps Anna to her seat. May enters. May has seen you. Now I'll have to hear all about your attentive and chivalrous you were for the rest of the afternoon. What? Nothing. Could you be an angel and get me some tea? I've been escorted here in such a queenly fashion. I would be perfectly ungrateful wretch to bounce up and bound over to the kitchen for a cup. Of course. Julian exits. <laughs> Isn't Julian a perfect gentleman? Yes, May. Oh, I don't know. I think he is kind of handsome. Nothing to my John, but still. Handsome. Considering all his pleasing attributes, that is still quite low on the list, don't you think? Oh, he does have an infinite number of winning qualities, as I am reminded daily. Come. Pat's on the seat next to her. May sits next to her. Poor Lou, to be hundreds of miles away, surrounded by strangers at Christmas. Lou will manage. Will they be able to manage Lou at Christmas? That is the real concern. She is fiercely jolly, isn't she? I'm certain the walls of Union Hospital are rattling with her insuppressible good cheer. <laughs> Julian enters with a cup of tea. He sets it in front of Anna. Thank you, Julian. May, might I get you anything? Just you, making yourself at home. Where's John? Lurking under the mistletoe, again. See now, May, I bequeath this tea to you and Julian. This is perhaps a venture that is better made without your assistance. I heartily agree. Excuse me. Anna exits towards the mistletoe. Quite the pair of turtle doves. There are times when I wish you Alcots weren't so familiar with me. You regret the day you brought mistletoe into the orchard house, don't you? Oh, never again. Dreadful stuff. You're anxious. Am I? You've been fidgeting all afternoon, and over the plum pudding at tea today, you hardly spoke two words together. That's not true. I said thank you. That's two words. And how many words can one reasonably expect to fit in with most of the Alcott's in their dining room? I know, Lou, being gone is quite a loss on the festive front. No, it's not Lou. You don't miss Lou? Of course I do. I've been speaking with my father. I only get the courage up from time to time. He's quite intense, he, like he's reflecting on every syllable you utter. Yes, I know. So anything particular to get you so rattled? My future. He have any thoughts on the subject? A novel's worth. May. I have something to ask you. Well, it's rather inefficient to tell someone you have something to ask. You should just ask them and whatever you needed to in the first place. 
May, you know I hold you in the highest regard. Julian. Anna re-enters. Let me beat him at a round of cribbage. Would any of you care in losing at a round of cards? Cribbage. Splendid. Yes. Splendid. End of scene. Act two, scene three. Setting, Union Hotel Hospital. At rise, Louisa's holding Johan's hand. He's dead. Julia enters. Lou, Louisa. Julia kneels beside her. Dr. Winslow doesn't think it's right for living flesh to be next to dead flesh for so long. He would tell you himself, only he thought I would be not bungle the message up in a frightful manner. His words, not mine. Lou, we need the bed. You know how this place has been filling up since Fredericksburg. A letters came from Pennsylvania. Julia pulls out the letter. His mother will bury it with him. He'll have something from home. Lou. Julia comes to sit next to Louisa. She takes Louisa's hand and places hers on top. She embraces Louisa. Lou, please. Please. Louisa allows Julia to remove her hands from Johann's. Julia embraces her. Louisa returns the embrace. End of scene. Act two, scene four. New Year's Day, Alcott's Parlor. Anna is seated at the piano, singing Old Lang Sang. May enters and wraps her arms around Anna. I am quite incapable of letting go. You must stay forever. We don't set out for Boston till tomorrow, dearest. You must be mine for the remainder of your visit. Oh, that was on my itinerary. Our schedule is very packed today. Good. Now, I'm going to go on a very rambling walk with you this morning, where we will talk nothing but daydreams, drama, and drivel. Excellent. Then I thought you might draw me to send a loo. I am ridiculously huge. I'm not sure you'll have a piece of paper big enough. I'll manage. Now, after tea, I might complain to John about my swollen ankles and aching back. You can complain to me, too. Oh, I wouldn't want John to feel left out. And I'm complaining to you, scheduled in the early afternoon. I'm certain I'll have a leg cramp or something else to move on by then. Now, won't I? I'm already black and blue on the inside from all of your kicking, dancing, and carrying on. <laughs> Excellent. And the rest of the day? We'll be spent doing whatever you like, my May darling. Julian enters, a newspaper in hand. President Lincoln. He's done it. What? Julian shares the newspaper with them. End of scene. Act two, scene five. Setting, Union Hotel Hospital, New Year's Day. At rise, Louisa enters with a basket of bandages. She coughs and is nearly delirious with fever. She leans against a wall or sits down to rest. Lizzie and Julia enter, excited. Julia is carrying a newspaper. She stops waving it excitedly and reads from it. All persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. The Emancipation Proclamation, President Lincoln. The streets, you must come see and wave your handkerchief, won't you? I can't. The church bells, oh, and this morning at the crack of dawn, I saw so many splendid fireworks. Folks are in their Sunday best, heading to the White House by the thousands to meet the President Lincoln. I should very much like to see the inside of the place, particularly Mary, Mary Lincoln's notoriously renovated blue room. Floors covered in velvet carpet, wooden chairs covered in silk damask. Such extravagant renovations at a time of war and scarcity. I can't imagine spending $25,000 on trinkets and flub dubs. I would like to shake President Lincoln's hand. That too, I suppose. And tell them both I'm sorry for the loss of their boy, Willie. Typhoid's a real killer. 
Mary Lincoln pays a host of spiritualists, they say, to talk to her dead boy. That's terribly tragic. Never mind. We won't be going to the White House to see any silk damask rugs or velvet chairs. Velvet rugs and silk damask chairs. We have typhoid patients to look after, whose mothers and fathers should like not to lose them. Louise is too sick. She faints. Dr. Winslow? Dr. Winslow! Julia exits. Lizzie bends down to comfort Louisa. Julia enters, dragging Dr. John. I'm not sure what the fuss is all about. Go on, about your business. You fainted, Lou. I just took a brief rest. I'll be up and about soon. You'll be up to bed soon. My pressing duties say otherwise. I give you a temporary leave of absence. You'll serve your country soon, but not in your present state. You're no good to anyone dead, Lou. Go on, to bed. <coughs> oh, it's just a trifling cough. Dr. John feels your forehead. You're an oven. I'm surprised you haven't caught anything on fire. You're mistaken, I'm shivering. It's freezing in here, isn't it? Right, bed. John, really? I'm taking you to your room. Julia, a basin of water, please. Lizzie, calomel. Julia and Lizzie exit. Right. On your feet. March to bed. Doctor's orders. This floor is surprisingly comfortable. The longer I sit here, the more appealing it looks. We need this floor to walk on, Lou. It'll only be a minute, and I'll be up and on my way. You can't sleep on the floor. Might I offer assistance? Suppose. Dr. John assists Louisa, letting her lean on him for support. Not fighting you off, but only because I don't want to make a fool of you. I understand that you could thrash me any day of the week, if you had the mind to. Good. When I put you to bed, you must stay there, not have me run about the hospital having to put you back again. Please, Lou. I could sleep here all afternoon. No, you won't. I need that shoulder. Dr. John exits, carrying Louisa. End of scene. Act two, scene six, setting. Louisa's bedroom at Union Hotel Hospital. At rise, Louisa's laying in her bed, delirious. Dr. John is seated reading aloud from the Pickwick papers. Stay, Mr. Chingle, said the spinster aunt emphatically. I entreat, I implore you. If there is any dreadful mystery connected with Mr. Tupman, reveal it. He appeared to be struggling with various conflicting emotions for a few seconds and then said in a low voice, Tupman only wants your money. The wretch, exclaimed the spinster with energetic indignation. More than that, said Jingle. He loves another. Another, exclaimed the spinster. It can't be. I won't believe it. John. Lou. You make a very fine Pickwickian. Thank you. Right. Back to work. Ugh. You've been delirious with a fever for almost two weeks, Lou. More the reason to get back to work. You have typhoid pneumonia. Had, had typhoid pneumonia. I'm fully recovered. Are you now? Yes, I'm just waiting for my body to get the message and I'll be out of bed. You'll see. You need clean air and rest and better care than any of us can give you. I've written to your father. I've only served for six weeks. I still have six to go. He's coming to collect you. I'm, I'm fine. I just need a few days rest. Where's Lizzie? Julia, they won't let you treat me in this infamous manner. Get them this instant. Go on, no dawdling. John doesn't move. John. John, where are they? Lou, you need to go home. Where are Lizzie and Julia? We'll write a letter this evening. I wish I had you to break this to yourself, but you're quite sick. That could explain why I feel terrible. Get Lizzie and Julia, please. Your father, I told him to take the first possible train from Concord. He should be here this afternoon, I hope. John. When did you start calling me John? I must be gravely ill if I can't muster the strength to give you a bad time at every available opportunity. I could get used to it. Well, don't. You banished me away back home, didn't you? I love you. I'm sorry. Was that too sentimental? I think it's all the Dickens I've been reading. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it suits you. Only not for me. I do think you're a terribly fine physician, really, I do. 
and a friend. Is that the only response I should hope for, or is hope allowed? Yes, yes, I'm afraid it is. Keep your hope for your patience, not for me. You made my writing a long time ago. I see. I better get back to work. The hospital is frightfully understaffed, what with the epidemic. Epidemics are damn inconvenient. I'll be back in to check on you after my rounds. Drink that water, won't you? Yes, yes. You sound like a doctor, you know that? I'll be back, as soon as I can be spared. You won't die on me, will you? We'll have to see, won't we? John, I can't leave without saying goodbye to Lizzie and Julia. They also got the typhoid, and it didn't sit well with them. They both were really fine nurses. And women. I'm sorry, Lou. Damn fine nurses. I'm so sorry. Louise is heartbroken as is Dr. John. Dr. John comforts her. End of scene. Act two, scene seven. At rise, the Alcott parlor. Julian is seated, a basket is near him. May enters. She is carrying a basket of dirty sheets from Lou's bed. She drops them. Glenn. I let myself in. I was instructed to do so. You practically live here, don't you? Why should anyone else be bothered to let you in? I took down the greenery. It was time. Don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yes, of course, the greenery. Julian holds out a basket. Mother sends some bread, a few baked potatoes, apples, gingerbread, a vinegar pie. We still have the gingerbread she sent yesterday. Mother likes to feed people to death on the best of days. Thank her. We would have starved to death long ago if she wasn't daily sending sustenance. I'm pacing and fretting about in a foolish manner. I want to be useful. Make me useful. You have a very fine pair of arms. I might be able to offer them some gainful employment. May sinks into Julian and he embraces her. I warn you, uh, I don't cry often. But when I indulge, I do so boisterously. Well... My shoulder is as good a place as any, and more than up for the task. So is mine, if the occasion ever arises. Duly noted. Your arms are pe playing a terrible trick on me. When I'm here, I believe all is well in the world, and I don't feel like crying in the least. I wasn't aware of their medicinal properties. It's a waste to spoil the precious time I have with you weeping. Julian releases her uncomfortable. You. I've hardly I'm, seen you. I'm the one who gets to declare I've hardly seen you, not you. How is Lou? Better off than she was in that hovel hospital. The conditions father found her in, a drab, derelict room, she was rambling incoherently. Lucky there's any left life life left in her. May, when did you last eat? Eating? What's eating? Eat something. Must I? It's like I fade with Lou. We're a house of ghosts now. I won't stand for that. Please, for me, for Mother. It really is an excellent vinegar pie. I've never met one of your mother's vinegar pies that I didn't want to make better acquaintance with. But not now, please. There was something you wanted to ask me, wasn't there? Good, hopefully. It can wait. Eat this first, won't you? No, no, please. I could use a glimmer of good news. Something shining through these overcast days. I got into Harvard. I see. That's wonderful. Why did you say, that's wonderful, and not, that's wonderful? No, really, it is. Really, it isn't. 
Harvard is unbearably far away from Concord. Yes, of course, from Concord. Uh, but still, you're very impressive in all the rest. Congratulations, Julian. The timing couldn't be more abysmal, leaving you. With Lou so sick, I mean, to, to leave you now. All of you. Yes, of course. I should postpone. A term, at least. Oh, nonsense. I'll drag you to the train station myself. I won't have you neglecting your vast potential on my account. Our account. They really expect me to leave. I suppose that's the only way you can get there, is to leave here. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. So soon. I'm assuming you didn't find out you got accepted to Harvard earlier than today, did you? I didn't find the right time to tell you, I suppose. We spend most of our time talking nonsense. I'm sure we could have squeezed this in somewhere between the drivel and idle chit-chat. The right time didn't present itself. There is not a right time. You should tell me things. What's important to you is doubly important to me because it's about you. You adore studying English all day, doubling away nonsense. I'm to study civil engineering. But all you do is pen funny stories and clever, clever riddles. You're hardly good for anything else. I appreciate your faith in my civil engineering abilities. Just because your musings are not all grandiose gothic with a dour dose of symbolism like your father's work doesn't mean they have no value. They are of great value. Having a father who is considered the writer of an age does put a bit of a damper on being a writer, wouldn't you say? Young women aren't the only ones who must worry about their financial futures, May. I could do civil engineering. Yes, of course you could. It does sound terribly dull. But my father is quite set on civil engineering. Sometimes I feel like he hardly knows me. Sometimes I feel like your father knows other people better than they know themselves. Julian, you'll manage beautifully as a civil engineer. Harvard feels like I'm being banished to the ends of the earth. Hardly. We'll meet again. In Paris, maybe? Paris? Yes. I'll be certain to invite you to view my works exhibiting at the Paris Salon. Wouldn't you rather show your work here, in Concord? Concord? Uh, perhaps Boston, then? I should be like a bird that never left her nest if I were to stay here. I was born to fly, Julian. Uh, no. I need to set up an e easel along the Seine River near Notre Dame to sketch in Jardin des Champs-Élysées to, st to do studies of Rembrandt and the Louvois. I am certain Paris shouldn't agree with me. It's terribly far away from Concord, don't you think? I shall send you sketches of the Tuileries garden. Of all the greenery that you don't have to pick and lug about for the Alcott sisters. But painting, May, that, that's more of a hobby, isn't it? Wouldn't you rather have a trio of Alcott sisters all your own? You could teach them to paint and how to get other people to lug greenery for them. Oh, goodness, no. I'll leave the children to Anna. My paintings will be my legacy. I'm quite certain. Yes, of course, to Anna. I best get back to Lou, and you must head home if you're to be packed for tomorrow. You must race home. Lou would have no other way. Oh, there was something you wanted to ask me, was it there? No. Nothing. 
You're quite certain? Yes, quite certain. If you need me, you need only write. I will depart immediately at your bidding. And keep you from your studies. I would never wish to be guilty of such a transgression. I expect to hear from you sparingly. I wouldn't want to disrupt you from learning whatever it is that civil engineers learn on my account. I'm certain Harvard will suit you marvelously. You are of the habit of making better every place you go. Goodbye, May. Goodbye, Julian. They stand awkwardly. Julian looks like he might speak again, but he leaves. May watches him go. End of scene. Act two, scene eight. Louisa is lying in bed, unconscious. May is sleeping on the floor, holding Louisa's hand. Anna enters. Anna, Anna. You didn't write to me. You're pregnant. I discerned as much. That doesn't mean I can't read letters. Father didn't think we should write. Oh, Father is a fool. I thought his hell on earth utopia, Fruitlands, taught you that. He thought you would come straight here. Well, not a complete fool. Anna kneels by Louisa. She kisses her forehead. Water. May hands Anna a basin of water in a rag. I would have preferred to hear from you and not Julian, but no matter. Anna proceeds to sponge Louisa. Julian? Yes, who else? He explained the direness of the battle and the need for reinforcements. It's like the sun has been pulled from the center of our universe. And all the planets are spinning wildly, unsure of their place in the solar system. Lou is our sun. Bright, combustible, pure light, life-giving in all fire and fury. Our Lou. Anna examines Louisa while washing her with the washcloth. How long has she been like this? A few days. Before, she was quite certain the room was filled with dying men pulling at her clothes, moaning, groaning, wanting to drag her away. That's the last I could decipher. She would scream and cry, and now this. The stillness, the, the silence, it's deafening. You don't think you'll hurt the baby? Oh, I wouldn't mind half the consideration this baby is getting. Now telling me about Lou? You can all beg for my forgiveness when she is on the mend. Open the windows. We must make it as much like the outdoors as possible. Lou is a wild creature after all, aren't you, Lou? Being cooped up in your room, let's get some fresh air in your feathers. It's not too cold. Dr. Bartlett said- Doctors are bigger fools than father. Marmy always said, and after Lou's letters from the hospital, I'm inclined to agree. We can add extra blankets if she looks chilled. May opens the windows. How long has she been in these sheets? I don't know. I, I don't remember. Right. Get clean sheets. And a new nightgown. May exits. Anna holds Louisa. Act 2, Scene 9. Night. The Alcott home. Lou's bedroom. Louisa is lying in her bed. Anna and Lou are sitting on the bed near her. Lou's hair has been cut off. I keep fluctuating from wanting to give her air and wanting to hold her ever so tightly. I'm quite sure I can hold her soul firmly to this earth within my arms. Not very selfishly, I do. The best part of being the oldest is that I should never have to see any of you make your exits. But I might do mine and a grand fashion with much ado, surrounded by adoring fans, take my bows with much applause, a standing ovation. Leave all of you to tidy up the stage in my wake, because to be without any of you. We should make a pact now, to live forever. Certainly, gladly done. None of this damn inconvenient dying business. It's not an ideal way to spend a Tuesday afternoon, is it? I haven't the time, really. She won't be happy about her hair. Dr. Bartlett said it had to go. To apply a plaster of dried and crushed beetles to stop the delirium. I've told you doctors are fools. 
her one great beauty. At least she thought so. I rather think it suits her. What happens if the sun is gone? It just doesn't rise in the morning. Anna feels Louisa's forehead. Let's see if we can't bring down this fever a bit. A fever is no match for a couple of Alcott sisters, is it? We've taken out an entire fleet of pirate ships in our day. Didn't we, Captain? Quite a scourge of the seven seas. Now, we'll figure out surviving till the end of the earth if we have to. But the horsemen of the apocalypse haven't ridden in yet, and I don't intend to let them have an easy time of it while I still have breath in my body. Anna squeezes May's hand tightly. They get back to work, tending to Louisa. Act two, scene 10. A bedroom, Alcott's home, late February. Anna is sleeping on the floor. May is asleep in a chair nearby. Lou is lying in the bed. She stirs. Anna shifts awake. Beth. Lou? Beth? She's not here, my love. You'll do. Anna embraces Louisa. May starts stirring. Anna. Yes. You're pregnant. Yes. Very pregnant. That's very right. Where's my hair? Dr. Bartlett cut it off to reduce your fever. Fool. I know. I suppose my hair is better gone than my wits. Yes, I suppose so. May runs to the bed and embraces Louisa. It's too much excitement for Louisa. Louisa takes Anna's hand, then drifts back to sleep. Anna kisses Louisa on the head. End of scene. Act two, scene 11. The woods around Walden Pond, early April, 1863. Anna enters, no longer pregnant. She is assisting Louisa. Louisa, barely recognizable. She is greatly weakened and now walks with a cane. We've come too far. I'll be the judge of that. You wouldn't deprive me of a visit to Walden Pond now, would you? Unless you need to get back to Frederick. I don't think I'll be able to pry him from Marmy's arms. A baby like yours and John's is always destined to make a, quite the theatrical entrance into this world. Take center stage wherever he goes. He is certainly a leading man, isn't he? That he is. You didn't have to visit again, you know. Oh, you shouldn't almost die on people. It makes them frightfully attached. I've noticed. I will bask in this excessive spoiling as long as possible. Good. I'm on the alert for the first signs of spring. She has noticed some arriving bird or a squirrel's chirp or her stores must now be sorely exhausted. Or to see a woodshed venture out of her winter quarters. I do like it when the ground is partially bare of snow. It's pleasant to see the first tender signs of the infant year peeping forth from the stately beauty of the withered vegetation. The life everlasting, goldenrods, pinweeds, and the graceful wild grasses, which have withstood the winter and are more interesting than in summer even, as if their beauty was not ripe till then. As if they needed the winter to become more beautiful. Is that nonsense, Lou? I adore your nonsense. Does motherhood suit you? Suits me very well, I think. Truly. He's a miracle. An exhausting one, but my miracle. Good. I can survive anything but your unhappiness. I am quite content. How is our May? Much improved, I hope. Having to pretend she's thrilled for Julian when she's a spawn it without him doesn't suit her. Oh, perhaps it would be better if he didn't write at all. Yes, perhaps. Perhaps it would be. May enters with a letter. Who shouldn't write at all? Oh, no one worth mentioning in polite society, dearest. Or in polite society. You are in my company, after all. I don't expect you to speak disparagingly of Julian on my account. Oh, I will speak disparagingly of anyone that makes you unhappy, dearest. I shouldn't wish him to waste away in Concord. He's... Much too exceptional for that. He's insufferably selfish, leaving Concord and a trail of broken hearts in his wake. Much like you did when you moved to Boston with John. That was an entirely different set of circumstances. <laughs> he must be allowed to live his life just as we live ours. I'm not so very heartless and selfish as 
to wish to deny him that. Well, I am. Wretched boy. We shall all nurse broken hearts together, May dearest. Although I never really cared for his company. Me either. A dull, timid, mousy lad with no pleasing qualities to speak of. His riddles were adequate, I suppose, but nothing to lose. Quite right. Did you think you said he was handsome, Lou? I did. You did? He isn't, not in the least. Oh no, a very homely, plain lad. I would go so far as to say unattractive, even unseemly repulsive. Oh, quite ugly. Surprised you didn't turn us all to stone. Oh. Now do you feel any better, dearest? You failed miserably, I'm afraid. And perjured in the process, a letter from Boston. I am certain it contains nothing as important as you, May, my love. Come here. May comes and Louisa puts her arm around her. How are you, dearest? Out with it. I did eat an apple yesterday and I could almost taste it. You must put him from your mind. I can devise countless better pursuits for your thoughts. Julian used to cut foliage for me for still lives, dead grasses like these. I would never remember a knife, even if I had come here for the express purpose of harvesting, harvesting something to draw. Orchard House, Walton Pond. He's everywhere, isn't he? We've grown together like the roots of two great trees, just intermingled. I could sooner rip myself apart than rip him from my mind. Well, I was had to make you forget all about him. Could you, please? That would be a queenly present. I will whisk you away to Paris. There we will submit ourselves fully to the delights of the city. We will be much adored. You will study painting extensively of all the great artists and become much accomplished and wildly successful taking the Parisian art world by storm. And you'll meet a handsome, charming man who will dote on you in excess. Hear, hear. And you will dance and laugh and be adored and admired by all of Paris. I'll see to it personally. And you know me, my mind is made up. That sounds like one of your stories, Lou. Send me to Paris. How? I will write a wildly successful book. About what? You two, if you don't behave yourselves. Oh, a book about us. Why not? You're both heroines worthy of your own novels. I'm certain if you're in it, Lou, you will steal the show. Naturally. No. Beth would, wouldn't she? Yes. Yes, she would. What about us should you include in this book? All of it. Every grisly detail. Even that time you burnt my hair? Yes, especially that. <laughs> or that time I... Oh, I burnt... I loathe to even remember it. Your book. I will never forgive myself. Most definitely that. Well, I've forgiven you. Only don't make a habit of it. Certainly not. How else will I get to Paris if I burn our ticket? And you go off to the hospital adventure to live and experience something to write about, only to turn home and write about us. That would be deliciously ironic, wouldn't it? <laughs> you won't include Julian in your book, will you? I do adore him, but I don't think I could bear to read about him. Not yet. Whatever you wish, dearest. It wouldn't be the same without him, though, don't you think? In my novel, he certainly wouldn't treat any of our heroines in such an infamous manner. Infamous manner? He left for Harvard! If you do include him, he must get his heart broken, most wretchedly, and ours are now in his absence. He will suffer a heartbreak no human body was built to endure. Certainly not. I should like a happy ending. True love conquering all. True. I do prefer happy endings. I'm at your command. So he must get his heart broken while still marrying his true love? Can you manage that, Lou? I will manage whatever my muses desire. She will manage it. And brilliantly, I wager. Thank you, Lou. I do prefer men in fiction to the real ones milling about. Men declare they will die for love, yet until they share their votes, professions, or institutions of learning, I have little use for the love of real men. We'll stick to the ones I pen. As will I. Nonsense. We'll have you steal the heart to some unsuspecting European or another in Paris, won't we, Lou? Would anyone read such a novel? Oh, they're lost if they don't. 
Speaking of publications, your letter comes from a Thomas Niles of Robert Brothers. You must open it, Lou. I mustn't do anything that I don't feel I must do. Besides, I fancy being sandwiched between you two free of distractions. You can wait, but I can't. May I? I grant you all the wishes that are in my power to grant. Go on. Well? Dear Miss Alcott, I was approached by Moncure D. Conway, who secured the publication of your hospital sketches for the Commonwealth. Rarely have I laughed or cried so heartily as I did reading this work. A touching comedy or a humorous drama, your work is indisputably one of rare brilliance. Fluent and sparkling with touches of quiet humor and lively wit, a triumph and tour de force. A work of great heart and even greater brilliance. Great heart and greater brilliance? That's our Lou. We can discuss your advance in royalty payments for the publication of hospital sketches in book form at your earliest convenience. I eagerly await your response. Sincerely, Thomas Niles of Roberts Brothers. Ooh, a book. You are to have a book published. I am. Are you quite sure? May hands Louisa the letter. Louisa reads it. I cannot see why people would like a few extracts from topsy-turvy letters written on inverted tea kettles waiting for gruel to warm or poultices to cool or her boys to wake and be tormented. Oh, Lou, a book with your name on it. I should hope my name is on the darn thing. I'll make sure five cents from each copy goes to children orphaned by war. At least I can do. Looks over the letter. It's quite real, isn't it? Yes, Lou, yes it is. I'll see if I can use this to leverage a better offer from Redpath. He's more established than the Roberts brothers. And the literary mercenary, after all. Oh, donating a share of your royalty to orphans? Yes, quite the mercenary. If I do write about you two, it'd be for the money. Oh, really? A book? Oh, Lou! May gets up, ready to race back to the house. We must tell Marmy and Papa and John. Oh, and little Frederick. I must include him, too, now in our celebrations. Not yet. It's a handsome trio of chickadees flitting about in that juniper bush. Perhaps we might watch them for a bit. Yes. Yes, of course. Louisa holds out her hand. May returns and sits next to Louisa, leaning on her shoulder. Anna takes Louisa's hand. The three sisters watch the birds. Lights fade. End of play.